Good morning, I'm Drew Sugars of the GCC Office of Communications and your moderator for the next 45 minutes. This is one of five sessions that we are hosting in Kreider Hall, during which we will meet the five finalists for those uh, for the five finalists to become the next superintendent president of Glendale Community College. During each 45 minute session, the finalist will stand at this lectern and begin with an opening statement before answering questions from our panel to my left. The five panelists who represent various groups at GCC are Terry Flexer, President, California School Employees Association here at GCC, Soler Okayan, Chair, Managers and Confidentials Group, Roger Dickey's Academic Senate President, Emily Haraldson, Guild President, and Diana Morales, President, Associated Students of GCC. As moderator, I will cue each question and remind how much time is left in the session. The indoor mask mandate remains in effect here at GCC. We appreciate everyone in this room continuing to wear their mask, but we have arranged for the finalists to stand alone on this stage in a safe, socially distanced manner so they may remove their mask during the forum. So without further delay, I would like to welcome to the stage Dr. Ryan Corner. Good morning, everyone. So I, I wanted to first say how grateful I am to be here today. Uh, it's truly an honor to be here and to share some of my thoughts for how we can move forward together and really embrace what has already been built at Glendale and set the stage for the next chapter and what we can do together. When I heard about the position posting, I knew this is where I wanted to be. The Glendale values of equity, focus on student needs, and of educational quality and success are really where I find my personal values as well. I'm not looking for a presidency. I'm looking to be president of Glendale Community College. And I think that's very important because you have something that's really special here, and I'd love to be the next caretaker as we move forward. So I'm thrilled by the prospect of working with you all, and I look forward to your questions today. Thank you. So our first question will come from Terry Flexer, again, president of our local CSEA. Terry. Thank you. What are the challenges that you are aware of that the classified staff are currently facing in higher education? And how would you resolve them here at GCC so that they do not negatively affect the GCC community? Thank you. When the pandemic started, Nationwide, we had to transition higher education overnight to remote working. And this wasn't just our classes, it was our services, it was administration, and classified staff were at the forefront of that. And so I want to start by saying thank you, because I know that in my experience, this work was done with care and with professionalism. And it was done in a way that had to balance what was going on in somebody's personal life as it related to COVID with what was going on with what they were doing at work. And that shouldn't be overlooked. I also start by bringing this up because I think this will continue to be the biggest challenge that we're going to face. Is how do we move out of the pandemic with an understanding of what our work world will look like? How are we going to understand the needs of our students as it relates to what needs to be in person and what needs to be online? And how does that impact the individual work within each of our classifications here at Glendale? I think that is gonna be the biggest challenge that we face. How do we make sure that we have a remote presence that is equitable and fair so that faculty and staff all feel that we're working together in a way that we can achieve something great for our students? I think when we look at this uh, changing workforce, it's really important to understand also that it's had an impact on our staff. Burnout is real. And I think one of the other challenges that we see among classified staff is a real understanding that we need to focus not just on the positions, but on the people. And really understanding that there is a wellness component to how we need to support one another. When we look at how to achieve both of these components, looking at the wellness and looking at how do we move forward in a way that our college can truly be successful and supportive of staff, the best way that I've found to do that is by engaging staff themselves. I've found that when we 
work directly with those who serve on the front lines, we learn a lot more than if we didn't. I've had this experience in my current role and in my past roles because the frontline staff are the ones who know when a policy that was best laid is just not working with students because they're the ones implementing it. And I would say that we, what we need to do is get together to define how this work is going to be handled, to really understand what the experiences are in each of the offices. Uh, we've done this uh, uh, currently at our Los Angeles Community College District, and it's led to great improvements in processes such as our admissions process, working with our dual enrollment students as far as how they're onboarded, and even with graduation petitions, which were really lagging behind. It was through engagement of the staff who were actually doing the work that we were able to learn what would work best for our students. And so I would say that those are two of the greatest challenges that we face, and the best way that we can move forward is making sure that we do it together with openness and honesty and really focusing on compassion for one another and understanding the circumstances that everybody is going through. We have uh, 40 minutes left. Our next question comes from Solaire Okayan. Thank you. As part of its mission, GCC is committed to student success by promoting global awareness and appreciation among our other core values. What role should international education and enrolling international students have at Glendale in achieving this goal of multinational, multi-ethnic, and culturally diverse campus community? I'm a big supporter of international education. I think that it builds global awareness by giving students the real experience of working with people from other cultures. And that is something that can't be replicated purely in the classroom or through book learning. It's something that really adds value. In fact, what we've seen is nationwide surveys have indicated that students feel that international students in the classroom add to the complexity and, and to the learning. And that's something that I worked to build when I was at East Los Angeles College. We had a very large international program, and oftentimes people would focus on it as it related to the budget. International education is not just about the budget. It's about what we can do in terms of building global awareness, and that's one of the core values that's espoused by Glendale. And I think it's essential that we focus on uh, international enrollment from that aspect, not just the budgetary aspects of what it brings to the campus. I do think that there's another concept we need to focus on, though, and that's allowing students to actually have an experience internationally themselves. Our local students and how they have the ability to go to other countries and learn from that experience. In my current role, I worked with the mayor's office for Los Angeles, and Mayor Garcetti developed a program called MAYA, the Mayor's Young Ambassadors Program. This is a program that's completely philanthropically funded that allows our students to go to other countries as ambassadors for Los Angeles to immerse themselves in the culture and to truly learn. We've sent students to Cairo, Egypt, uh, Durango, Mexico. They're in Mexico City next week. Uh, to Vietnam, to Tokyo, and every summer to Paris, France, because Paris has actually uh, committed to having an annual relationship that focuses on STEM education within this international framework. I think that's a huge experience for our students. Many of the students that we've worked with not only didn't have a passport before we started this process, they'd never been on a plane before. And to really be able to experience that global awareness, it, it showed that diversity is not bound by national borders. Diversity goes beyond that, and really having an understanding of how we all interconnect together is essential. And so I would say my support would be for not only building a strong and robust international enrollment program, but for also making sure that we provide opportunities for uh, international education abroad experiences for our students. With 37 minutes left, our next question comes from the representative of the Academic Senate, Roger Dickies. Hi, Ryan. The faculty of Glendale Community College prides itself on the GCC culture of effective shared governance through vibrant engagement with administration by its guild, Academic Senate, and long-standing division chair's leadership system. What steps will you take to support and protect the faculty voice on academic and professional matters and enhance cooperation with and among administration, guild, senate, and division chairs 
so as to build enthusiasm among our faculty going forward. Thank you. I'm a big supporter of shared governance. What I've been able to see in my career is that where colleges struggle is when they don't have governance in place, when there's apathy or a lack of a structure that encourages people to be involved. And so I'll start by saying that this is part of my hallmark of leadership style. Throughout my career, I've worked on consensus building, building a shared vision for how we can move forward, and I've truly found that that's the most effective way, to bring in people with diverse perspectives and lenses, whether it be from the classroom or from the counseling uh, or the librarians, and really making sure that we have a full understanding of how everybody views the success of the college. That's one of the core components of success. Currently, I work with nine colleges, nine. Nine academic senates, nine unique governance structures, nine independent cultures. I've become adept at really understanding how we can navigate together and working either cooperatively with all of these governance groups together or independently with each of the campuses. But I think the core lesson that I've learned through this experience is you don't try to fix what isn't broken. Glendale has a proud history of governance. When you look at the governance model that you all have put together, it, it was one of the leaders in terms of coming out of 1725 and showing the state how it's done. So in terms of steps to make sure that that is encouraged and continues to be facilitated, the first step would be making sure that everybody's aware that I'm joining your culture, not the other way around and that what we really need to do is seek understanding and work together. To do that, I would start by trying to build trusting relationships with each of you so that you know that my commitment is to seek understanding and to listen first, and also that accountability really starts and ends with me, and that you should hold me accountable for the actions that I have and make sure that I'm working within your governance structure. I think when we look at this, we can empower each other to work cooperatively within our existing structures, but also expand the faculty voice beyond. More and more what I'm seeing is that the conversations I have with academic senates is less about what we're dealing with locally and more about what's coming down from the state. And that's troubling because it changes the dynamic of the conversation and sometimes it shifts us to focus on areas where we weren't already looking. And I think in the future, what we really need to work on together is making sure that advocacy is part and parcel to what we do in shared governance, and that we can explain through our collective knowledge the nuance that is sometimes missed when we look at things at a state level. The understanding of classroom teachers, what they're actually seeing with their students, and how we can best move forward. I think when we look at this advocacy effort, we can make sure that the Glendale faculty voice is pervasive in the discussion and we can show how things actually work well so that maybe there's not a need for a legislative solution. And I, I think that would help encourage the faculty to participate both locally and also with an understanding that you'll have my support to make that voice known at a state level. 32 minutes left in this session. Emily Haraldson, representing the Guild, has the next question. Glendale Community College, like most colleges statewide, is facing a long trend of enrollment decline, leaving us down about 25% over a nine-year period. This year, it looks as if the downward trend in enrollment may be even steeper than prior years. How do you plan to leverage GCC's assets, such as our non-credit continuing education areas, one of the largest in the state, distance education, outreach, counseling, faculty members, and marketing communications, and public information office to enable the college to return to serving more rather than fewer students? I think this may be one of the most challenging times in higher education. The enrollment declines were, were heightened by the pandemic. And what we saw is that where we lost students was those areas where we had fought hard to make sure that student access was available for students of color and for low-income students. Essentially, when you look nationwide, the pandemic wiped out decades' worth of work on equity. And so it is urgent and it is essential that we work to regain that access and make sure that our communities have this available. 
The good news is that Glendale is well situated to operate on this challenge. You do have great assets. Uh, you are able to focus on this history of service that this college has had to the community and build off of that. What I would say is moving forward, we need to look at the actual student-centered funding formula and have an understanding of how we can use that to benefit our population and our students. I'm a supporter of the principles, the overall principles of a student-centered funding formula because it focuses on real th three core issues. Access in terms of enrollment, equity in terms of looking at the supplemental areas with um, undocumented students and students uh, with low incomes, and student success in terms of looking at the milestones of what we do. Those are things we're already working on. And if we focus on the values in which we're trying to achieve through our global planning, it becomes less about trying to maximize the student-centered funding formula and more about an understanding that what we're doing will naturally maximize our funding. In terms of looking at access, non-credit and dual enrollment are essential. Those are two of the few areas that were actually growing statewide prior to the pandemic. Uh, in fact, in many cases, those two areas were buffering some of the losses in other areas. And that's something that we have to be aware of and really be able to grow. Both non-credit and dual enrollment also have full funding rates within the formula that gives it an additional financial benefit to our college. What I would say is that non-credit has the ability to grow, uh, particularly in the career technical education and basic skills areas, and we'll talk a little bit about that later with one of the future questions. And dual enrollment can grow as well. You have a great footprint in working with GUSD. In fact, over the last year, you've increased enrollment and increased the number of classes offered through dual enrollment. But there is more that we can do in terms of growing uh, that program and making sure that every student coming through our local unified school districts has an opportunity and takes a class with Glendale Community College. I think this will benefit us not just in terms of the enrollment, but also in terms of establishing that pipeline so that students can be successful when they get to us. In terms of um, looking at the other elements of the funding formula, it's essential to remember that it's really about how we service the student. Uh, just prior to the pandemic, we were able to curb some of the enrollment declines uh, in the Los Angeles Community College District. And one of the focus points that we did to achieve that was looking at how we supported students. Uh, you mentioned all the different assets that Glendale has. We need to bring all those together. Uh, we need to make sure that we implement our guided pathways that's part of the, uh, your strategic plan and have an opportunity to really focus on the pipeline and the onboarding process for students and reassess it with what we've seen to be successful with guided, imp imp guided pathways implementation and also with the challenges and successes that we've seen with the pandemic. Things have changed and we need to make sure that we have a better understanding of where students are at. Now what I will say in terms of moving forward, we need to also have an understanding of where the trends are at with our students. Which of our trends are pandemic driven and which of our trends are here to stay? And really craft a balanced approach so that we have an opportunity for students to have experiences on campus and also the flexibility of remote offerings. Uh, that, that will be essential when we look at that. All of these things are great. They're very good tactics. There's things that we can assess and work on together. But I think the approach is perhaps more important than the tactics themselves. And the approach really needs to be one of working together and an understanding that innovation and change is going to become a norm. Shortly after the founding of Glendale Community College, the country was found itself in a deep depression. And President Roosevelt said, the country demands experimentation. Demands it. Not just needs it, but demands it. And I think we're at the same turning point with higher education. We need to experiment. We need to innovate. We need to incentivize and support those who want to try new things knowing that not everything we're going to do is going to work. 
Oftentimes, we're so afraid of failure that we don't try something, and we need to be encouraged to experiment. That's what many of our disciplines focus on, is experimentation, uh, whether it be in the STEM field or the arts. It's ex about experimentation and understanding what will work. You have to get there through the process. And so what you'll find is that I'll have a commitment to making sure that we incentivize and support individuals who want to try new things. And for those things that we have found to be effective for student learning and for increasing access to our communities, those are the areas that we're going to want to invest in. Our next question comes from Diana Morales. We have just under 26 minutes remaining. Good morning, Ryan. Please share what you have done to close achievement gaps among disproportionately impacted students in your current role as an administrator. Thank you. I think one of my proudest achievements right now is the work we've done with our LA College Promise. Uh, this was a partnership that we developed back in 2016 with Mayor Garcetti with the intent on offering a first-year experience program that would be free to all first-time, full-time students. Now, what's unique about the way that we approached this is this was not a tuition-based program. It may have free tuition, but that wasn't our intent when we decided to build the program. We brought in faculty, we brought in staff, we brought in administrators from all nine colleges with the intentionality of developing and designing a system that would support students and close the equity gaps across our campuses. That was the actual intent when we designed the program. And we've seen huge successes because we've built in structures like counseling, built in structures like a summer bridge, built in structures like student coaching so that students are aware of how to navigate midterms and finals. And we've seen that the data has proven it works. In our first cohort in 2017, we launched the pilot with 4,000 students. Right now, the LA College, uh, LA College Promise program represents 36% of all entering first-time students across our nine campuses. And amongst that, we see a greater representation of low-income students, higher Pell rates, higher fee waiver rates. We see more undocumented students than our general student population. And we see 90% ethnic minority amongst that program. The success elements are higher at every single milestone, whether it be completion of English and math, whether it be the first year persistence, or what we're most proud of, a 42% increase in the number of students completing within three years. That is huge for moving forward. We're building on that. We're doubling down in terms of making sure that we have a robust second year program, which we can do a better job of. That's something that we need to focus on. We're doubling down in terms of making sure there's additional resources and support services for students, whether it be the free metro passes that we're giving to all of our students, technology, or looking at student basic needs and making sure that as we build out the program, it retains its equity focus. Based on this, we have integrated many of these lessons learned into our general guided pathways discussion and really asked ourselves, how can we replicate that which was part of a full-time program in other meaningful ways for the other students who may not have the opportunity to go full-time? And that's been part of what we've been looking at. Uh, in addition, we partnered with UCLA and we authored a national paper on how to create effective ecosystems in terms of promise programs for undocumented students. Every single state has a different policy as it relates to how undocumented students can participate in higher education and are charged. And so we wanted to build a sense of how we can actually take the lessons learned and give recommendations to other areas that are trying to improve on the service to this student population. Uh, in addition to this, I've been the lead administrator with our African American Outreach Initiative. This is an initiative that predated me, but one that has continued to focus on developing outreach activities to the African American population so that we could stem some of the enrollment declines that we've seen over the years. We've worked with groups like the Brotherhood Crusade and the LA Urban League to make sure that we have a robust uh, program of outreach. And we've also worked to increase Emoja or other student services programs across all nine of our campuses. I also serve as the lead for our LGBTQIA 
Advisory Committee. And one of the uh, proud moments for that is that we developed a Bill of Rights for the students. A real commitment to what students should expect, which could serve as a hallmark for really saying, we see you. And I think that has been truly meaningful. And every year we celebrate the success through a Lavender graduation. It started with 12 people, by the way. And now we're, we're over 100. Lastly, I think when we look at uh, equity, we really do have to focus on professional learning and making sure that folks have the tools that they need to be successful. In terms of this, uh, I worked with our administrators to make sure that implicit bias training occurred for every single administrator across our district. This was in partnership with Sean Harper from USC. And then we built out that partnership with USC, similar to what Glendale has done in joining the Race and Equity Center and making sure that we can have long-term, year-long professional development that helps us put things in place. Real proud achievement, though, is the work we've done with our AFT Faculty Guild. With our AFT Faculty Guild, we actually put into our contract mandatory implicit bias training. This was something that we all supported. And once it was in the contract, we then had the great question of, who's going to do this? And you know, we went through all of the concepts of, do we want to bring Sean Harper in? How do we do this? And what we settled on is really my division working with faculty themselves throughout our campuses who already have expertise in this type of work and developing it ourselves. Because it's much more meaningful when it's something that's coming from within that we can do together. And I'm really happy to say that that training is complete and it's going to be launching uh, this semester and next semester with the goal of 100% of faculty going through that training. With 19 minutes remaining in this session, we're going to go back now to Terry Flexer for the next question. Thank you. What would be the necessary steps in fostering an environment to ensure the district's commitment to providing for professional growth and career opportunities for the classified employees faculty and administrators within the district. Thank you. Parlaying off of uh, the previous answer, I, I think professional development is key. Uh, one of the biggest resources we have on any of our campuses is our human resources. We spend more money on faculty and staff than we spend on any other aspect. And if we don't invest in professional learning, we're not going to be able to move our institutions forward. Uh, that's just clear. Um, I think the best step we can take is making sure that we design and develop it collectively. In my experience, that is where I've been able to see the greatest success in terms of professional learning. Uh, with our District Academic Senate, we host jointly two summits every single year, one in fall and one in spring. The fall one focuses on broad issues that we collectively agree need to be discussed. In the past, we've talked about things like student basic needs, uh, basic skills in AB 705, student equity, and uh, this year we had a, a, a big discussion on uh, the hybrid nature of instruction. Uh, when you look at our spring session, it, it shifts a little bit, and it actually fits within the division structure that you have here at Glendale. Uh, we call it Discipline Day, and it's actually kind of a, a global setting where we, we paint some pictures of some big ideas that we want to work on together, and then we let everybody divide into their teams based on their discipline expertise so that there can be that, that ground level discussion that we sometimes don't create the space for. I mean, we have, we have division and department meetings, but oftentimes that becomes about operations. This is an opportunity to really delve into the curricular issues that are impacting each discipline. Uh, we've done the same thing with our deans and administrators. We created a dean's academy that was focused on enrollment management and effective leadership practices. And we're doing the same thing with our vice presidents uh, within the Los Angeles Community College District. Uh, we have over 30, two-thirds of whom are new within the last two years. We need to invest in professional learning. And in this case, we've partnered with the schools of education for both USC and UCLA working together to design and develop a leadership academy that would be focused on our unique needs. Um, and engaging the vice presidents and the presidents in that discussion has been essential to really understanding where our gaps are. Now, with classified staff, we have some additional things that we need to work on. 
We have our basic training. Uh, we've worked through 3CSN to make sure that there's classified staff uh, training. But one of the things that has always bothered me with the way that we set up our structures is we don't practice what we preach in education when we talk about human resources. We are all about pathways, career pathways. How does one get from one job to the next? And then we look at our actual ability to do that within our classified ranks, and all of a sudden it's opaque. It's not clear how one can get from one position to the other, and we need to make sure that we have an active focus with classified staff so that we can help staff who want to pursue their passions and pursue upward mobility get from one position to the next. We can do that through looking at the translatable skills and providing excellent professional learning so that we can grow our own. Lastly, with, um, with our classified staff, we do have a program called Project Match, which is focused on helping uh, those who have not taught in the community college system before, uh, but meet minimum quals, get an experience that includes training and mentorship from existing faculty members. Over the last few years, we've put an increased focus on making that widely available to our classified staff who may want to pursue teaching as well. So my overall perspective on professional development is making sure that it's ubiquitous on campus, that it's highly encouraged, and that everybody knows that investing in yourself is an investment in the college itself. We have just over 15 minutes relate, uh, remaining. I'd like to now go to Solera Kayan for the next question. Thank you. GCC has the seventh largest non-credit program in the state. Considering the current enrollment and immigration trends, what is your vision for non-credit programs and how does this fit in the district's overall mission and goals? I think we already talked a little bit about the fact that non-credit was one of the few growth areas prior to the pandemic. It's also been one of the areas hit hardest by the pandemic. It's essential that we continue to grow non-credit. It serves different functions in terms of working with our adult populations in our communities, and um, we can really grow it to make sure that we regain the access that has been lost. In my current role, I oversee adult education and non-credit uh, within our district, and as part of that, I've worked with our LA uh, Adult Education Regional Consortium, which the LA Community College District serves as the community college on, but we partner with Los Angeles, Culver City, Montebello, and Burbank Unified School Districts to make sure that there's a collective vision for how we can operate within the region. In part of that work, we developed an incentivized process for development of curriculum within our own district. Enhanced non-credit curriculum was not growing at the rate it needed to be to serve our students and to serve our communities. And part of that was we just didn't have the resources dedicated to it. And so we developed a funding model that really incentivized innovation and new programs. Uh, as an example, LA Southwest College developed an MC3 program, which is a construction program, where students, after weeks of training through Southwest College, actually get immediate employment with construction companies that are building LAX. That's, that's a huge commitment to the community. LA has wanted to hire its own, and we wanted to make sure that we were part of providing for that. And so I do think that there's a great ability to grow uh, non-credit CTE and non-credit basic skills in ways that can support our communities and enhance our enrollment. I think that it's a direct alignment uh, to your vision and values here at Glendale in terms of creating pathways. And we need to continue to look at the pathways and how non-credit and credit align and how students can be aware of where they can integrate into our system when they need different things in their personal lives or their career lives, how they can learn and grow in each of these areas. Lastly, what I'll say is there's a need to reinforce the value of non-credit. I think it's a shame that we define anything by the lack of what it doesn't have. I mean, we're defining non-credit by the mere nature that it's not credit. That doesn't do a service to non-credit. I mean, that, that's, that's not where we should be. And, and you all do a much better job in the term continuing education and making sure that there's this opportunity for the community to really understand the value. And I think we need to double down on that and really make sure that people are aware of the excellence in instruction and service that can come from a non-credit department 
and that we combat some of the stigma that is sometimes attached uh, to non-credit programs. These are exemplary programs that really serve our students and our communities well, and we need to make sure that our marketing and advocacy really reflects that. We have just over 11 minutes left. This is our final question, which will be asked by our Guild President, Emily Haraldson. The COVID-19 pandemic forced almost all instruction at Glendale College into the distance education context. Just three days ago, the Guild held a town hall meeting on the future of remote work at GCC, in which faculty exchanged deeply held points of view regarding how much of the instructional program should remain in distance ed, how much should return into the in-person context, and how best to support college culture and student enrollment success if the pandemic subsides, as it, as it appears it may. How do you envision promoting GCC in the coming years, given the growth and popularity of distance education and the value of sustaining in-person course offerings in the on-campus experience? Thank you for saving the easy one for last. <laughs> um, th this will be one of the greatest challenges we have in terms of academic discussions moving forward. I mean, the pandemic really showed what we could do. We're capable of moving a majority of our programs online. But capability does not mean intentionality. We, we didn't do it on purpose. We did it because we had to. We proved that we could do it. Now we need to ask ourselves, should we? There are some programs where learning outcomes will be well situated for continuing in online formats. But there's others that may need that in real life situation in order to really make sure that the students grow and are able to learn what we intended when we developed our curriculum. The fact of the matter is these conversations are already taking place at universities who don't have to balance the nature of open enrollment like we do. Just a few weeks ago, USC announced that they will no longer, starting summer of 22, take foreign language courses or lab science courses that are offered in the online modality. That's huge. The UC system has uh, tended to play it both ways. Uh, the system office says, you can continue to offer. Articulation is modality neutral. And then a student tries to uh, transfer into engineering, and that department says, yes, we will transfer this course. You'll just have to retake it with us when you get here because you took it online. That's not fair to students. We need to make sure that students know this, and we need to make sure that these are the concepts that are integrated into the academic dialogue that we have. So how do we begin this conversation? I think we have to begin this conversation with a commitment to our academic values and really making sure that the Academic Senate can provide the premise for how we want to approach online, hybrid, and uh, uh, in-person learning in the future. I think we also need to engage each of the divisions independently. Every single discipline has unique properties that make it either better for online or detract from the learning outcomes when we look at things in an online format. And it's essential that we have that conversation both at a global level and within the discipline expertise that we have within each of our divisions. I think we need to really build on that. Now, don't get me wrong. Just because this is challenging, that does not mean, great, we're going to go back to pre-pandemic, everything's fine, it's going to be exactly the way it was. It, it will not be the way it was. Distance education is going to continue to be pervasive, we are going to see the demand from students in terms of making sure that there's flexibility, in terms of making sure that schedules meet the needs as it relates to their personal lives, whether it be a student parent or whether it be somebody who's working full time. There will need to be these options. We will need to have student preference as a major consideration for what we do, but it can't be the only consideration. We have to balance this with our academic integrity and with our academic quality and really make sure that we make students aware of why we're doing things and how it relates to their own personal learning. So when we embrace this challenge, what I'll say is that we have to create value added for what it means to be on campus. Glendale already has tremendous components in its athletics and its arts. I mean, just walking down the hallways and seeing the artwork and, and really the community 
centric feel and vibe that this campus has, that's what we need to play up. When we talk about promotion of on campus, we need to think of GCC as tradition meets innovation. Students need to want to come here, not just because of what happens in the classroom, but what happens outside the classroom. We need to make sure that we have a campus that beckons students to engage. We have to have a campus that rekindles student government and activities so that students want to be here for all of the right reasons and we really call on students to be back on campus. I think if we do that, we can truly find a balance that promotes all of the best of Glendale, both online and in person. And that is it for questions. We have just under six minutes left, which leaves you time for a closing statement, Dr. Corner. So thank you. Um, yeah, this was fun. I was a little nervous getting up here, but uh, that, that, that ended up being fun. Um, throughout my career, I've served as a classified staff member, as a member of the faculty, administration, and now as the vice chancellor for the LA Community College District. What I can say is that I've built a track record that shows that I'm a consensus builder, I'm a collaborator, and that the way that I can get things done is by working in partnership. For every success that I can point to, there was a counterpart on the other side who helped me get there. Whether it be the Senate, whether it be the classified staff, whether it be other administrators, whether it be students. These are all conversations that need to happen collectively. If given the opportunity to serve as the superintendent president, you'll find that I'm committed to continuing that proud to tradition here at Glendale of mutual respect and dedication to the process and building consensus. Uh, not just because that's your culture, but that's also what I believe in. And I think that's very important as we look at the challenges that we have to embrace coming out of the pandemic. These are gonna be some difficult discussions. And the way that we will get through them is with a consistent understanding that we need to work together, and that together we can actually create more than we do independently. I know that you have exceptional capacity here. I know that Glendale can come out of this pandemic serving as one of the strongest examples of how to do things right. I hope that we can work together to really write the next chapter in the Glendale history books. A chapter built on collective action, a chapter built on innovation and student success, and a chapter built on setting the exemplar for how to do higher education right and serve the community. So again, I, I just want to thank you. I hope we continue to have the, the ability to work together. And um, good luck with the rest of your search. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Corner. Appreciate it. I'll bring your things out for you in just a moment. Just a reminder that our next session, our third and final for the day, will begin at the top of the hour. We stream these on our YouTube channel. This has been recorded. You can watch a replay of it at your uh, convenience. We'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you.